Welcome to the Burn Bag Podcast. My name is Andre Gonoella. Uh, this is our first regular episode in a while. Uh, we had a one in the world session uh, on Venezuela about uh, about a week or two ago, but this is the first regular episode since we uh, came back from our hiatus. Uh, again, some things have changed. Uh, I'm Andre. I'll be your primary host uh, from here on out. And uh, we want to sort of reinvigorate the burn bag. We want to bring on different types of guests, guests of all ages, guests from a multitude of backgrounds who can sort of share their experiences, their expertises on issues pertaining to foreign policy uh, and national security. So we're very excited to embark on this new phase of the burn bag here with all of you and our audience. We want to have some really engaging content and profile people that you've both heard of, but also you may not have heard of. Uh, I'm very sort of delighted, actually, for our first episode back to have Sarah Wahidi uh, joining me on the podcast today. Uh, Sarah, I got to speak to Sarah uh, this past Friday. Uh, Sarah is an Afghan national who moved to Canada at the age of six, but returned to Afghanistan uh, over the years for work. Uh, she is a technologist and a human rights advocate who created the digital app Etisab, a verified monitored platform uh, that shares real-time emergency information on everything from electricity outages to explosions, public demonstrations and gunfire to Kabul residents in Afghanistan. Uh, this digital app has become a lifeline, especially for women and girls, uh, especially since the Taliban took over the country uh, in 2021. And this is sort of an app where they can get reliable reliable information about the dangers around them. Uh, Sarah is one of the most impressive people that you could ever meet. Uh, she's in her 20s and she has a background and a career that so many of us could only aspire to have. Uh, Sarah has received a multitude of accolades as well. She was recognized as one of Time Magazine's Next Generation Leaders in 2021. She was also on MIT Technology Review's Innovators Under 35 in 2022. She was the Entrepreneur of the Year uh, by One Young World in 2023, was included in the top 100 inspiring and influential women's list uh, by the BBC in 2021. And in 2023, she was named to Forbes 30 under 30 list for social impact. Uh, we, I got to speak to Sarah on Friday, which happened to be uh, the third anniversary of the Taliban's takeover of Afghanistan. We got to talk about a range of topics relating to Etisab, uh, the story behind how she created the app, how that idea to create the app sort of came to be, uh, the state of women in Afghanistan, uh, her reactions to the international community's treatment of Afghanistan, and just so much more pertaining to the country, to women in the country, to all people in the country. Uh, but I've been wanting to interview Sarah for... I think a long time now. So I was really delighted to have the conversation uh, finally happen. Uh, but for now, you know, here is my, you know, really fantastic, really insightful and really informational uh, interview with Sarah Wahidi. Uh, here you go. Thank you. Welcome to the Burn Bag Podcast. My name is Andre Gonawala. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by Sarah Wahidi. Sarah is a technologist and human rights activist who created the digital app Etisab, a verified monitored platform that shares real-time emergency information to Kabul residents in Afghanistan. Uh, this digital app has become a lifeline, especially for women and girls, since the Taliban took control of the country in 2021, uh, as they can get reliable information about the dangers around them. Uh, Wahidi is an Afghan national who moved to Canada Canada at the age of six, but returned to the country over the years for work. Uh, while she's not working full-time managing her startup from New York, uh, she just did attend Columbia University. Sarah, congratulations on graduation, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, Sarah, actually, where are you going to be heading now? Uh, in about a month, I will be headed to Oxford. That UK. is exciting. That is exciting. Have you spent yeah. much time in the UK? Not at all. This will be my first time, so I'm very excited. Okay, so everyone says the British food scene is quite bad, but <laughs> I beg to differ. I think all the immigrant sort of influxes have created a very diverse food scene there. Okay, well, yeah, I'm excited. I've heard amazing stuff about fries and chicken and a lot of the immigrant enclaves and just your uh, classic fish and chips, obviously, which I'm a huge fan of. So I, awesome. I'm positive. Yeah, I mean, there there is hope for folks like us there. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, Sarah, uh, I mean, thanks so much uh, for joining me here today. I'm really delighted and honored that you're like joining me for this conversation. Uh, and like, I mean, honestly, like you're one of the most like impressive, talented, like people in their 20s that I've met. I mean, the app that you have created is incredible. Your story is so incredible. And I really wanted to just hear more about your story, about your experiences and about the app over this you know, hour we have together. And uh, I think our audience will be very intrigued uh, by a lot of this. But I think, first of all, uh, today marks the three-year anniversary of the Taliban's uh, takeover uh, of Afghanistan. Uh, and I'd love for you to share a bit about your reflections about this solemn day. Every year it changes, to be honest. The first year, the first anniversary was unbearable. I, I just wasn't able to wrap my head around what had happened in that full year. Uh, last year, I was so busy with work um, and projects that I wasn't able to really uh, kind of sit with myself and contemplate and reflect on the year. Um, and and this year, the third year, because I'm I have a bit more time and and I've just recently graduated and I guess I have more time to think. I'm I have a mixture of feelings of I'd say anger and disappointment. Um, and I would also say a, a bit numb. And the reason for that is things have gotten so much worse in terms of the world normalizing what's happening in um, in Afghanistan that it's almost, uh, it gives off this feeling that perhaps this, I guess, hypocritical stance on women's rights could essentially permeate anywhere else in the world. I think that the fact that we allow a country to systematically erase an entire gender, to stop women from going to school simply because of their gender, I don't think we've really sat with ourselves and realized how preposterous that is. The fact that there is absolutely no reason. It's not about a safety. It's not about security. It is literally just about women being educated. And I don't understand why that doesn't have the entire world up in arms. Uh, and every year that passes, it becomes more normalized. Um, and this is one of the biggest travesties, I think, of our time, is that we've allowed 50% of the population to essentially be erased. Um, and then beside that, I have also glimmers of hope, feelings of hope. And the reason for that is right now, at Ehtisaw, we're working on projects in the country with amazing women on our team who live in the country. And for them, I think August 15th, in some ways, is a day to mourn for those who I, I believe uh, still believe in democratic rights and human rights and, and fundamental freedoms. It is a grieving process, but I think for most of them, and a lot of my colleagues that I spoke to today, it's just another day and you have to get up and you have to keep going. And um, even, you know, as today was rolling around, I was trying to see how much support that I could give them, how I could be there for them. And you can sense that they just want to keep going. They want to find solutions. They want to work on how to normalize, um, this new reality in terms of how do we find ourselves as Afghan when I'm speaking, um, on their behalf, how do we navigate this? And how do we continue to fight for our fundamental freedoms, perhaps in more innovative ways, in ways uh, that aren't, uh, I guess, the the status quo? And my job is to facilitate their journey. My job is to help them uh, use their knowledge and their experience to keep going and to build a better future. And I think it's it's been said before, but the future of Afghanistan lies in the hands of Afghans. In terms of when do they believe that it's important for women and girls to return back to school, I'm talking about the men. That is something that I think Afghans have to grapple with about how important is it for women and girls to be in school and to be pursuing their dreams. The last 20 years, that reflection needs to happen among Afghans. And that's not for me to discuss on what that timeline will be, but... I think this is the time to allow Afghans to have those conversations with themselves and then to facilitate those conversations, but also do everything we can to keep women at the forefront. And 
of course, I've had the privilege of being able to share a lot of their stories, but I've worked really hard on pushing them to learn English, learn French, learn these these uh, global languages so they can share their stories themselves in safe in safe ways because it's much more impactful for them to hear it from these women than for myself. I, I do my best to evoke those stories, but in the next coming years, I'm going to be focusing a great deal on the world being able to have direct access to these stories from these women um, because they're the ones that fight every day. They're the ones that get up and, and do what they can to continue and to prosper. So it's a somber day, but I would say that I feel more hopeful for uh, how the women of Afghanistan are, are navigating this, um, especially being able to see so many projects that are happening underground that I had no idea about. Only recently, the last couple of months, I've had access to learn about how much is going on. And there's a lot of really important work happening. I think the reason, for example, we're feeling a lot of dread is we don't hear those success stories. And the reason for that is because, unfortunately, they can only succeed if they are under radar. Um, but I hope that the message that I can leave your viewers is that there is a glimmer of hope. There's a lot of very good work that's happening in terms of women's education, in terms of um, health care, maneuvering informal network systems of, of women and, and girls. So all we need to do is to continue to donate to uh, important organizations that are that are trusted and uh reliable, obviously grassroots organizations in the country, women-led organizations, um, UN Women, uh, the International Rescue Committee. So your donations do make an impact. And I can say uh, as a witness to that, uh, they are going, those donations go a long way. So I really hope that people take away that perhaps sometimes you're not hearing about the work, but the work is going on and, and we do need the global support still. No, absolutely. And I think what you sort of mentioned that's super important is communicating these stories and for the world to hear these stories that are going unheard uh, and so on. Uh, and Sarah, you know, I'd love to hear a bit more about, you know, your own story. Uh, like, you know, what uh, has sort of driven your goals, you know, like now you're running the app, you've gone to Columbia, you're about to go to Oxford. What's your sort of story and what's sort of driving you, you know, in your story? Well, I haven't really shared a lot of this, and I, I was, um, I, I've been reflecting a lot about graduating from Columbia, and obviously being in the public eye, you you work with the press and you work with, uh, you know, people who um, kind of curate your identity. But I today I reflect on the privilege that I have to be here, to be speaking with you, to be doing this work, and my motivation as cheesy as it might sound, and I think that this is something that many people say is, is my mom. My mom sacrificed her life, her future, her dreams, her everything for my brother and I to be here in Canada. And she is one of the most curious, most friendly, most hardworking women that I've, I, I know to this day. And um, she brought forth to me this importance of education, but also to be a very fierce and independent woman. And my whole life, I've worked really hard to make my mom proud. And the fact that I can see her be so proud of me um, in this journey, it feels like I've been able to meet a few life milestones, but I see in my mother, the girls that currently struggle under the Taliban regime. My mom was a, I would say, um, 20 something year old during the first Taliban regime. So exactly me, but one generation earlier. And she was kicked out of her work. She was kicked out of university and fled Afghanistan, just like many women did in 2021. And I feel like I am repeating my mom's life in a lot of different ways in terms of witnessing this horror, witnessing this regime come back into power. Um, but what really keeps me going is to hopefully show her that women can fight back. In the first regime, the world saw Afghanistan as this orientalist, you know, um, uh, context that no one could really get close to. You had obviously 
probably, you know, evening news media of the, the larger um, news organizations in the late 90s, but you didn't have the social media, the vast access to information that you do now. Um, so I think it was quite a, a, probably a frightening taboo for people to really talk about what was ha- happening in Afghanistan. And then probably one of the most infamous images that came out of Afghanistan was the woman in the burqa who was shot in the head in the stadium. That was uh, one of the most, uh, I think, profound images that that reached every corner of the earth. It's a it's an image that many people bring up to me when they think about Afghanistan. Is uh, you know the first time that I er- ever heard about Afghanistan was either you know the graveyard of empires or uh, this image of this woman um, being stoned and 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 shot. And what I have now a chance to do is to reframe that image of what Afghanistan is by centering women who work in technology, in um, healthcare, innovation, um, literature, everything in between. I have the capacity to show such a beautiful and and, um, prosperous image of, of women and what they've been able to achieve over the last two decades. So I guess in short, I'd say, Uh, or in summary, one is my mom because of the fact that she reflects the first regime and so much of what they sacrificed. And also for this current generation that's uh, reeling from this this new reality uh, to uh, put on the forefront everything that they achieved over the last 20 years and to make sure that that's not forgotten and how we can facilitate um, the continued growth uh, and success of Afghan women and girls. If it means that it's not, like I said, the status quo or the normal processes, um, using innovation and, and using what we can to help them achieve their dreams and goals until we're able to um, hopefully see another chapter of Afghanistan, a, a positive and and free and fair Afghanistan, whenever that may be, but we still have to keep working. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, I was listening to, I think, one of your interviews from maybe a year or so ago, and uh, I learned that you're very reluctant to be labeled as an entrepreneur. Uh, but that you'd rather be labeled, I think, as a technologist, as an activist. Uh, can you tell me a bit more about that? Like, how do you sort of see yourself? The reason why I don't like to be called an entrepreneur is I don't, as a technologist, as someone who works in technology, I've had the privilege to work with Apple for two years. Um, I have always been drawn to technology as a force for change, not as a force to profit from. Mm -hmm. And the connotation of entrepreneur has a profit component to it. And perhaps that's why, you know, although with all the the accolades and all of the the, the media and publicity, perhaps one of the reasons why, you know, Ehtisab hasn't become this, you know, multi-million dollar platform is because I have never seen it as a platform to become rich from. I mean, I have paid for Ehtisab for the last three years out of my own pocket to pay the salaries of my staff. Um, Netlinks, our, our, our partner, um, pays for the, the admin panel and a lot of the technical um, aspects. But in terms of the daily costs, I've managed that out of my own pocket. And um, I think that the fact that we still don't see um, technology as a force to, for, I don't, the fact that we don't see uh, technology as a means to invest in for social currency is something that I feel is uh, incredibly alarming and disappointing. Um, you know, you have to apply for grants, you have to apply for, for, uh, for smaller amounts of money to be able to, to keep stuff like this going. But I would love to see an era where uh, shareholders invest in applications like my own or or in startups like my own uh, that focus on building sustainable, holistic, and healthy communities. I believe that one of the most important things in terms of building sustainable communities is to facilitate conversation and collaboration and not just uh, look for ways to make money and profit off of, of, of vulnerable communities. So yeah, entrepreneur is something that I don't personally connect with because I build technology, even if it can be more costly, um, just due to the fact that I believe more in the impact. And I don't like connecting impact with money. And I find that when venture capitalists talk about impact, it's very rarely about the actual impact. It's about 
you know, how much can you get back in terms of your buy-in? And um, I've had venture capitalists reach out to me, many of them to, to ask. And the first question is, you know, love your mission, love what you're doing. Can you tell me about, you know, uh, your profit mechanisms and how much do you take in at the end of the year? And it's, I just kind of stop right there because that's just not the conversation that we're supposed to be having here. Um, so it's unfortunate that we still don't have those kinds of mechanisms. I would love in the future to become uh, perhaps a, a venture capitalist that invests in a technology that just does that, that is just solely focused on impact. For example, if uh, a, a startup said, hey, you know, we are able to keep, um, you know, you know, two or three provinces in our country um, um, online and get, you know, provide access to to, uh, to education, remote education for children. That for me is an investment because that is something that provides a positive outcome for local communities. And I don't understand why there has to be a profit component to that. That, that is something that we should be investing in. And it shouldn't be just an NGO mechanism because the thing with NGOs and the reason why I never approached Ehtisab as an NGO is that it's not sustainable. Every year you're going to have to apply for grants and every year you're at the behest of your funder. And for me, the importance is to build technology that is self-sustainable, but also has impact. So yeah, I don't call myself an entrepreneur, uh, definitely a technologist. And even with activism, I find that also to be, I guess, a bit, um, uh, I, I don't, I don't connect with that either. And the reason for that is, um, I'm a realist. Sometimes I, I say things that perhaps people don't like uh, in terms of Afghanistan's context. And that's because, of course, I think um, I have emotions and obviously I, I, I share my emotions. But for me it, to be a technologist and the work that I've had with Ehtisab, a lot of people have said to me, you know, you don't ever mention the word Taliban in your reports. And why is that? And for me, it's because Ehtisab is a service. It's not politicized. And we'll talk about that probably later on. But that means that I I don't take political stances on a lot of things because I have to do my job in a way that is able to see everything holistically. Uh, and that sometimes means that I have to put my own opinions and my own interests on the back burner while I focus on on the technology that I build. It's sort of just about like the practicalities, right? You sort of handed this system, however flawed it is, and obviously very flawed in Afghanistan right now. But it's like, how do you work with it because at the end of the day how do you get the help to the people who actually need it the most mm -hmm. in the beginning it was easier so I'll, I'll divide the question in two parts it's important to understand that ehtisab's journey was i would say more impactful um the year before the taliban's uh, came to power and then probably about a year after. And the reason for that was i built ehtisab at a time when there was incessant gunfire uh, exchange, IEDs, um, explosives, suicide bombings. I mean, I'm talking about a city that was reeling with um, instability and violence on a daily basis. That was the Ehtisab that I created. Uh, that, that was the Kabul that I created um, Ehtisab app for. That was a context. And then obviously a year after, People are now reeling with this new regime. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know if it's going to be like the first regime where they're going to be going door to door and dragging people out and having um, public executions. That that's been happening, obviously. But I think that the world, the reason that it's probably not happening as incessantly as it was in the beginning in the first regime is that the world is watching the Taliban, and the world knows, regardless of the proxies in hand, whether it's China or Russia or on the opposite end of the axis, the Western world and um, the United States, they still have to, they're still aware of who's watching. So um, in the first era of Ehtisab, we were seeing reports come in, you know, 20 to 30 a day. And that was because there was so much happening and there was so much, uh, it was so much easier to get reports in. The second era, I would say, was from 2022 up until right now. And that is an era where I would say a lot of people have accepted that the Taliban is the regime in power. Uh, the, I'm talking about the local people, I'm not talking about the diaspora and those who 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 uh, who protest against the Taliban. Mm -hmm. And another thing is that another component is that the Taliban was the main proponent for violence 
up until 2021. They were very actively looking for control of the country. Um, and that was what Ehtisab app was reporting against. Th that, those were the reports that we got in the explosions, the suicide bombing, the gunfire exchange. That was mainly the Taliban. And we know that because ISIS-K in this new regime, you know, other than their pr predominant target, which is the Hazara minority um, in certain parts of Kabul, they continue to attack uh, the Hazara population, that has been their focus. And we've seen, you know, that happen even within the Taliban regime. But everything else, it's become very clear in terms of the pattern of violence that the, that the Taliban was a main proponent of, of, of this violence. So we saw a huge uh, decrease in reports. And the reason for that was that the Taliban stopped attacking the city. Uh, now their job was to maintain decorum and to build trust. Obviously, th that's a word that I use lightly, but in terms of the everyday people, um, you know, you're not going to be able to build that trust if if they don't feel safe. Uh, and that is something that you hear a lot from local uh, community members: is we do feel safer than we did before 2021. Um, and Ehtisab app just doesn't have that many reports now. So I believe that the impact and what we were able to do for Afghans was so much more impactful in the beginning. And the reason for that was just the level of violence that was there. I'd say for now, in terms of the second era, I focus a lot on documentation. Mm -hmm. I focus a lot on trying to build that library of information, um, that, that, that data source for the future, if ever, anyone were to need it. But in terms of, I'd say daily impact, you know, the Taliban definitely calls the shots now. And the reason for that is, um, the service doesn't work as it used to before it was instant, immediate alerts because there was so much happening. And I think that Ehtisab's future will really depend on the expectations of the Afghan people. Because if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the first and most important need is uh, shelter, food, and water, and safety. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that once you have safety in a crisis region, your local constituency wants more. Then the requirement, and then, then the next need is a career, a sustainable job, economic aspects, feeding your family, having a, a better home. This is what the Taliban will grapple with in the future. And perhaps that's when Ehtisab will morph into not just mainly security as we began, but perhaps civic issues, corruption, um, the responsibility and accountability of Talib uh, officials. So we'll, we'll see. But I think the impact in the beginning was security. Um, and, and we'll see in the future how Afghans maneuver Ehtisab and, and how we're supposed to, to change the app to work with the new normal um, and the, the nuances that, that Afghans will, will grapple with in the future. And I believe that they're gonna be asking more of the Taliban and, and we'll see what that is in the next coming years. So I'm really curious because, I mean, I spoke a little bit about in the introduction when, you know, what Atasab uh, is and does, but I'd love to hear a bit more from you about, you know, what was the motivation uh, behind starting it? I mean, like I'm nearly 27, I hardly, can think about what I'm going to eat for dinner. And, you know, you're in your 20s, you were in your earlier 20s uh, when you started the app. And I mean, it's an incredible, I mean, I feel like starting an app is obviously an incredibly hard thing to do for anyone. And you're also working in the context of the socio-political environment as well. Uh, so I'm really curious about like, you know, what, what spurned uh, Atisab in the beginning? Like what how did that sort of story play out, I guess? I guess that's my question. So the story begins, and I, I, it is actually a story to, to the great way that you put it. And the reason for that is before this incident happened in 2018, I, I never even thought about working in technology. I thought that I would be a policy aide working on migration and social development. That's where I was at the time. I worked at uh, the president's office as a policy aide. The position was funded by the International Organization for Migration, um, but my job was to, to work um, at the president's office. So it was 2018, I was walking home from work, 
and uh, it was March 2018. Um, probably just, I don't know, maybe two, three minutes away from home, I saw that people were just yelling and there's some sort of commotion going on. And uh, some people started running and maybe three or four seconds later, this giant explosion, like, like just the loudest pop I've ever heard in my life. And didn't even look behind, just kept running. I saw everyone run, ran to my home. And as soon as I stepped on my balcony, my balcony faced the, the area where this explosion happened. And it, as soon as I stepped out, it was just this explosion, like a mushroom cloud. And it was like a movie. I, I was just like, what? I mean, it just, even today, I mean, I have videos and photos of what had happened. I still can't believe um, that that day and then that moment. And so I'm, I watched the explosion and then I just kind of see people running you, because obviously the explosion, you can't really see what's happening behind the situation. Um, as it dissipates, you know, you see these insurgents go into this area um, and then they kind of disappear. And then a few hours later, you see Afghan national forces come in on the other side. So we're just kind of watching this play out in my apartment on, on the roof of my apartment, kind of like a movie. And that night, uh, so I would say probably that we were on lockdown in the apartment for about 12 hours and it was just explosion after explosion, grenade exchange, gunfire up until probably 11 p.m. And the next morning, I mean, the street was just just riddled with glass and debris and just destruction of infrastructure and, you know, stores and shopping carts that I would visit every single day. Um, obviously I lived in an apartment that had running water, electricity, it was very well kept, but my neighbors, you know, had no electricity, no water. There was so much debris and I was angry. We had no idea what was happening. Um, we had no idea what had happened, what was, you know, who was the, the perpetrator. And, um, I later learned about uh, some some people who stayed in the, in my apartment who who worked for consulting firms and and for embassies and things like that that they all had these these alerts on their phones, um and and it said you know uh, it it had our address on it uh, it said you know District Ten where I lived um, explosion um, probable ISIS K attacking Indian visa office I didn't even know that the Indian visa office was right in front of my house oh, yeah, for yeah. the three years that I lived there all this information. And I was asking everyone, I said, you know, what is this thing that, you know, what are these texts that you get? And they said, oh, you know, this is for people who work, you know, expats, uh, diplomats, foreign consultants. It's to keep us safe. It's to keep, give us information. And I was like, that's so fascinating that, you know, you can just have your phone and it's just going to send you uh, immediate alerts. So um, just, yeah, pondered that for a few weeks and I just kind of got obsessed with this notion of like accountability. I was just like, I was just so angry at, um, you know, the local government, the fact that the debris had still been sitting around for weeks um, and my obsession became accountability. I, I thought that the, the solution to this was, uh, you know, some sort of platform that connected residents with uh, city officials. And I thought that, oh, the way that we can mitigate things like this happening is if we hold our city officials accountable, if they were accountable, you know, we'd have better safety and we'd have better civic services. Um, but that was the 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 incident that uh, inspired the Hesab of, of today. So how does the app actually track threats? Like, how is that information gathered? Of course, if you're able to, you know, share that. So it's completely uh, team led. There is no um, models, no machine learning or models that kind of um, obviously uh, forecast security issues. Um, of course, if I had had the opportunity um, and I had access to 20 years of military data from the United States, you know, perhaps we could have worked on learning models to see if we could have at that time um, seen trends and, and would have been able to forecast uh, security issues, but that was 2018. I don't think that we were we were at the place we are now with AI and machine learning to have been able to work on something like that. Perhaps if it was now, we would have been able to to use that. But anyway, um, so how reporting works is uh, the team manually scrubs um, news media organizations, Facebook mainly, um, Twitter, 
uh, Google search to see basically keywords like explosion, Afghanistan, ma main provinces, um, homicide, any kind of keywords. We have a whole bunch that we use. And manually, the team will go and uh, find those manually every you know uh, 30 minutes to an hour and post uh, any verified reports that we can that we're sure of uh, that have been verified by other news outlets. In terms of reports that we would get from our users, that was more difficult. So, for example, if um, a user had said, you know, I hear gunfire exchange, now we'd have to wait. We'd either have to wait for a news organization to to uh, verify something like that, or we'd, we'd reach out to a news organization. Um, obviously, before twenty twenty one, our um, triangulation of verification was much larger and, and, and I guess much more impactful because there were just so many people working in security at that time. Um, but yeah, first step is to scrub, um, online and to see any reports. The second goal is to verify, see other news outlets that have posted it. And then the third is to push that notification out into our users' phones. Um, but yeah, that, that's basically the process. That's super interesting because I mean, like my family's from Sri Lanka, uh, and when that civil war was occurring uh, until two thousand and nine, I mean those types of apps didn't exist, but uh, there was a big sort of ISIS suicide bombing in twenty nineteen, and I recall sort of scouring uh, social media to sort of figure out like what's actually going on because you know those first minutes you sort of see on social media it's just like pandemonium mm -hmm. as you see all this misinformation, disinformation, and sort of snap judgments. So I'm very curious about like, how does the team sort of navigate the challenges of disinformation when, you know, these types of attacks, these events are so much more frequent? Well, we, that's a great point. The way that we navigate it is that we sacrifice time. So what I mean by that is because we focus so much on posting alerts uh, and reports that are verified, we sacrifice a great deal of time to keep uh, to notify your users. So, for example, let's say that within seconds of an of of some sort of a gunfire exchange, we get an alert from our user from a user that you know I'm hearing gunfire exchange. It might take us hours to actually send out an alert or to post it on the platform because we have no one to verify. Yeah. So we have a lot of reports in our database that have never been sent to our users because we can't verify it. So for example, perhaps a news outlet might in five minutes post, you know, some sort of incident here, but Ehtisab app will take 30 minutes. And the reason for that is I would rather delay an alert and be very confident that it's true instead of sending out something that isn't. Because then our users are like, you know, okay, I'm getting this alert. And then find maybe perhaps later on they find out that's not true. Well, that's just a, 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 a level of stress that we just created for no reason. Loss of confidence as well. Yeah, and a loss of confidence. And I never wanted to do that. So I'd say if, if our users had something to perhaps um, uh, some negative comments on our part, they probably say that the alerts come in very late. Um, and that's something that I take responsibility for. But it's only because I would hate to send out an alert. And we've almost had a couple of incidences where we have. We've, we've, we've been grappling in our team, our group chat of, okay, should we send out the alert or shouldn't we? And every time we decided, okay, we won't, we found that that wasn't true. And we could have made a very big mistake of sending out an alert that, that was not true. So we do sacrifice a great deal of time. In the beginning, it was easier. There was UN alerts, there was US embassy alerts we would kind of piggyback off of them and perhaps we'd able to we would be able to send out an alert within 5 to 10 minutes but after the taliban came into power a lot of those security mechanisms just disappeared so we're looking at probably a 5 to 10 minute delay pre 2021 and probably post 2021 i'd say a 20 to 30 minute even sometimes an hour delay um so it really depends on the context but i've always sacrificed time to ensure that our users can trust the alerts that they see on their phones. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you know, you talk about that sort of the manual sort of scouring of data of social media and like the verification process. 
uh, earlier you talked about how a lot of this came out of your own pocket. You were spending your own money to sort of fund this. What were some of the biggest challenges aside from those in actually, you know, creating the app in its infancy? I'd say all of my my trouble came about um, after the Taliban came into power. And the reason for that was we had such a momentum before the Taliban came of building this app that was meant to forge civic engagement and citizen engagement. Once the Taliban came into power, we completely stopped marketing the app. We completely stopped doing any sort of interviews. Of course, the the the, the, the global world kind of, you know, the, the, the interest spiked. But in terms of the local population, I was grappling with partners and colleagues who said, you know, you're going to put a lot of people in danger if you keep marketing this. And I knew that that was true because recently, one of the few platforms of citizen engagement, I'd say, is a news media outlet called Afghanistan International, which is based in, in D.C. Um, they have this WhatsApp number where people can send in uh, videos, uh, photos of things that are happening in Afghanistan. A few months ago, the Taliban released a statement or a sorry, a decree that anyone that was found to be using that WhatsApp number to report to Afghanistan International in D.C. would be arrested, which mm -hmm. gave me the 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 message that if a app had grown, I mean, we're looking at a regime that would have been going door to door trying to find my team. And my team are, we're like an average of like, you know, 25 years old. I, I could not, I did not have the security infrastructure to put my team in danger. So one was, of course, we wanted to expand the service to as many Afghans as possible. But then I had to grapple with my team and their safety from working from home. I mean, once the Taliban came to power three years ago on this day, my team left the office and started working from home. Um, but... So, you know, one was security, um, but it was also how do I provide the service in a way that's uh, safe for not only my team, but also other Afghans, but also stick to our mission. So it's been really difficult having a tool that I know could keep the Taliban accountable, not only in security, but corruption and so many other civic issues, but also realizing that this is a regime that doesn't play by the rules. Yeah. I mean, this is a regime that will go to door to door, that will find people that speak against them. And I, as a CEO, and as a founder, didn't have the capacity to tell my team, you know, we can go full speed ahead and work on this, but also I can, I can promise you that you will be safe. And um, unfortunately, that really stunted the capacity for me to scale the impact of Ehtisab was the fact that we worked in... In, in the in an environment of one of the only regimes in the world that you know completely just uh, stands on the antithesis of freedoms and rights and navigating that kind of reality and, and I, I'd say that we've tr we've done our very best I'm I'm honestly shocked that we kept the app going for so long I thought maybe in the first year mm -hmm. we would be done um, but somehow we we really you know kind of chugged along and and have made the best of maneuvering. The, the Talib environment. No, and it's absolutely a small scale operation that's doing so much, you know, for Afghans, for so many people. Um, and I mean, I'm sort of curious because, I mean, you talk about a lot of the difficulties occurring after the uh, Taliban took over uh, the Afghan government. Uh, I guess like sort of before that, I mean, when do you sort of realize that the Afghan government was going to fall? And how did that realization perhaps play into how you thought about the app's operation, you know, as you're sort of seeing this change occur, as it's sort of like about to occur? Because, I mean, it would be, I mean, for me, it would be impossible to think about, like, how do you adjust in such a fast paced to some unexpected uh, development? I will be very honest with you. I did not think that the country would collapse until it collapsed. Okay. I was, even though we worked in security, we worked in reporting. Up until I saw the image of the Taliban on top of the a stolen army, an Afghan army jeep with their white flag entering Kabul province, I still thought the Americans or NATO or someone would just come in and just say, okay, enough is enough. I really did believe that as, as much of a naivete that might be. Um, I didn't believe it until, yep. Yeah, 
CNN, I think, was the first one where Al Jazeera posted the image of the Taliban sitting in the president's office. And that was just an absolute shock. So I would say that, you know, a lot of people who work in security, a lot of people who work in journalism and reporting probably felt the same was that this, this, I mean, the green zone, the U.S. embassy, the U.N., the World Bank, everything was in Kabul. I mean, how could the Taliban just walk in with no um, with, with no one kind of fighting them? So I didn't expect it until I saw it. And then the next step was, and I was reading our, our, our chats from three years ago today with my team, and I asked them, I said, it's up to you guys. I'm in New York now. I've left. I left by then. Um you decide, do we still keep this going? And I remember it was one of the longest moments of silence, like five minutes of my life where I'm just like holding my phone and just trying to figure out what does my team want to do here? Um, because in those moments, all the reports that we were piggybacking off, UN alerts, the US embassy, everything just shut down. Once the Taliban entered, I mean, it was just mass exodus. So now we're the only ones who are working on reporting. And I'm like, okay, okay, if we stop, then we stop now. And we shut everything down, we take the laptops and we just stop or we keep going. And I got the green light from them and they said, no, we'll figure out a way to keep this doing this safely. Let's just go home because they were all in the office at that time. Everyone go home and we'll we'll keep working from home. Um, obviously, COVID helped that a bit because it was probably a year after COVID and we were still kind of working from home. So it wasn't that big of a shock to suddenly leave the office. Um but yeah, I, I'd say that you know th- those few pinnacle moments were were when we realized that um, we had a responsibility to keep this going. I mean, these these foreign security platforms had left, and now we were the only ones, and we had a responsibility to document what was happening, try to keep users informed as best we could, um, but then also at the same time grieve the loss of our country. Um, so it was a, an extremely chaotic time for us, but I would say that I'm so proud of my team. They are the, the ultimate superheroes. The fact that they were there witnessing this happening and still kept this app going for so long is something that's astounding to me. It's also been uh, bittersweet to see them live their lives after. I mean, my biggest goal is, as their, as a leader was how do I help you maneuver your life? And I would say every single person, except for one of our our leading team members, left the country. The the, the last one will be leaving in a few months. Awesome. So it's really heartbreaking to to I guess see, you know, kind of the, this this momentous moment where we had you know ten to twelve youth working so hard from media to research to to tech to now just having a couple who you know kept this going because he believed in the mission so much but then to see the rest of them go to northeastern and the another one is in china and another one is in france and um you know it, i think it sub ab signifies the the resilience of afghans but just to, to the heartbreak of having to leave your home because of war regardless of the beautiful work that we were working on not just the sub app but so many other amazing afghans who built fantastic uh platforms and and technology and and um change but to see a lot of that have to unfortunately close because the context that we that we we deal with doesn't allow that kind of innovation to continue so what does being an afghan mean to you i mean you talk about just these incredibly inspiring people including yourself by the way like it's just so awesome and admirable what you're doing uh, I mean, really, with no, like, with like no desire for something in return, almost, right? Like, so many people will have an idea to start an app, will commit to work because they want something monetary, they want something financial, they want some sort of a betterment in their own personal, individualistic like life, right? But I mean, so much of this is just you and your team giving. So, what does being an Afghan mean to you? Because I mean. I understand it as resilience, really. I mean, that's a great question. I've never been asked that before. Being Afghan for me means having to prove yourself day and day and day after. I mean, I I constantly struggle with the first few seconds of seeing someone's face of when they say, oh, you're from Afghanistan, you know? And it, you can just see that, 
some people can be judgmental in uh, a pitiful way and some can be judgmental in a very negative way because unless they're very much involved in the regional politics and the regional context, the idea that we had, you know, co-working spaces and tech entrepreneurs and amazing Afghans, you know, building their own startups and businesses and the Afghanistan that I lived in from the years of 2016 up until 2021 you know, you don't, you, you have to spend then hours upon hours of saying, you know, the, the Afghanistan that you, you know, and the prejudice that you hold isn't the one that I know of. So I'm constantly having to define myself as an Afghan. I'm constantly having to defend myself. But I think that being Afghan has given me, yeah, one of the most resilient and stubborn personalities that I think a lot of Afghans share is one of making something out of absolute nothing. Afghans are some of the most entrepreneurial, and I mean entrepreneurial people in the world. Uh, you know, if you see any video of, of Afghanistan today of, you know, kind of uh, local Afghans sharing day-to-day -day life, you'll see someone who will just, you know, grab a stool, grab some oil and just start, you know, shoe shining because they just want to make ends meet. And um, I think a lot of us have that kind of personality and resilience ingrained in us is that we just make it work however we can. Um, and that can bring a lot of stress on the body. I think that that just has happened from generations of trauma. I mean, we're looking at entering our 50th war, uh, 50, uh, probably fifth decade of some sort of war or instability in Afghanistan. And that stays in the body, that that comes out regardless of me growing up in Canada, it comes out in different ways. I see it in my mother, I saw it in my grandparents. So it's, to be Afghan is, is a privilege in a lot of ways, but it also holds a lot of responsibility and a lot of trauma. And I would say that a lot of Afghans agree is the way that we maneuver that is to find something that connects us to the country uh, and to do our part. I'd say that the reason I'm able to be probably so grounded in who I am and my identity is that I work on something that I feel brings impact. Whether it's extremely small, people can argue about Ehtisab's impact. You know, mm -hmm. that's their own decision and 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 own um you know own prerogative. But for me, just being able to document something, being able to maybe send out one alert for me is the most impactful thing. A lot of people focus on especially in the Western world, how many downloads do you have? How many people do you have people seeing the app all the time? It's not the same context as it is in the United States, not the same context as it is in Canada. Impact for me is very different in Afghanistan. Building the seed of the, the sociological notion of when you see something, say something, of um, you have a fundamental right to access to information that's not politicized. That doesn't come in numbers. It comes in behavior. So for me, it's building the small steps instead of looking for the big numbers because in a place like Afghanistan you have to work on the long long game you can't work on the short numbers that that just doesn't work it works in other contexts but it doesn't work in Afghanistan so um it's been a privilege to to work in in this space but um it, it's yeah to, to be Afghan is something that perhaps is something that in, sometimes especially in, in the most traumatic moments and the moments where I've been the most uh, depressed and, and and dealing with a lot of, of personal mental health issues. I, I, mm -hmm. I, I struggle with being Afghan because of how much we constantly have to sacrifice. I had to witness my mom escaping and then I had to watch my home be lost for me because I had an apartment. I had a home, my best friends, my family, my, my, my grandparents and watching that again, was just so traumatic and and I hold a lot of anger, but we've dealt with this before and we'll deal with it again. And I just hope that I have the strength to deal with it in the next chance we have at a, at, a, at a better future for Afghanistan. I really hope that I I still hold that strength. So I'm leaving some space for myself, some distance with my work so I can be what I need to be at the moment it comes forth. 
I mean, you are very strong. I mean, I understand, obviously, right? Like, it's a huge struggle. But I mean, like, you are the epitome of strength right now, at least from this conversation and from many of the other interviews that I have, like, watched you give. And like so many people in Afghanistan are the epitome of that and your team as well, who I understand are unnamed for obvious reasons. But like mm -hmm. someday, you know, I think we'd love to learn their names, you know, if that's of course. Possible. And like hear their stories. And I mean, I think something that you, you know, mentioned, I think, is are, are those reactions, you know, when you say you're from Afghanistan. Uh, and I mean, for our generation, uh, you know, you experienced this, you lived it uh, for folks like, you know, U.S. citizens like like me and so many of my friends, you know, we hear about the war, we saw the war, but it's almost like it's like so far away that you don't really think about it in a real sense, you know, like it's just so far away that it's not going to impact your daily life. So it's almost like 2021 happened, August 15th happened, and then shortly thereafter, it's almost forgotten in the lexicon as you just move to the next news cycle for so many Americans and for so many, I think, foreign policymakers in D.C., uh, mm -hmm. for so many people who I've had on this podcast who are Afghanistan experts, you know. Uh, and I'm just really curious about, you know, like you have so many of these people, these experts, these practitioners in the foreign policy space in D.C., the U.S. government, et cetera, who are talking so much about Afghanistan, uh, but are almost sort of talking about it in this sort of passive sense. What are the biggest like challenges in communicating these real stories, these real difficulties? I think I saw uh, one of your statements about, I think, the international community's repeated statements about just, you know, women's rights, girls' education in Afghanistan, but there is no backup behind those statements. So, I mean, like, how, I mean, how challenging is that? And how do you work through those challenges? Uh, well, I mean, it's obvious that the world is exhausted uh, uh, about the topic of Afghanistan. That's, that's very clear. Um, and I think that just the disastrous way the United States mm -hmm. uh, departed from Afghanistan will be remembered in a very, you know, in a, in a very dark way, uh, especially for, for countries that are watching what happened in Afghanistan. I don't think that any country in any crisis region will ever trust the United States to make a statement like, we're going to come in here and fight for your, you know, fight for your fundamental freedoms. Yeah. I don't think anyone is going to buy that because that was a statement that George Bush made uh, before the United States entered Afghanistan. Laura Bush made her very famous U.S. address on uh, on, on the radio, stating that the the Taliban was this uh, this this treacherous regime that was animalistic and that barred women and and you know ripped off their nails um if they were wearing nail polish that was what the u.s uh the, the u.s people the american people heard on the radio in 2001 and 20 years later the taliban that they replaced they replaced the taliban with the taliban i mean they literally yeah. in 2019 in doha shook hands with the Taliban, the same Taliban that they defeated, you know, 18 years prior. That, and I think that the United States probably just doesn't understand the impact. They probably thought, you know, okay, sure, you know, we, we fought them in 2001, but they probably changed and we can build some sort of government where they're doing some sort of power sharing. And that didn't happen. I mean, it, it was just the, the absolute opposite. And you can tell U.S. officials, especially the ones that I've met, just do not want to talk about Afghanistan. You know, they always talk about, they'll share with me, you know, I was based in Afghanistan in the early 2000s, or I visited Afghanistan, you know, oh, such a heartbreaking place. But you can tell that they just really don't want to talk about the U.S.'s involvement in Afghanistan. No accountability. Or no accountability. It's, a, it's just very uncomfortable for a lot of people in the U.S. to talk about. Um, I I can understand that, obviously, um, but a lot of Afghans feel anger, fury, 
because the United States invested so much in, in education, in women's rights. I mean, we had 400 women judges, mostly you know, trained by U.S. judges in the United States who, you know, put the Taliban in jail, members of the, the Taliban in jail. They were trained by U.S. lawmakers, U.S. Uh, legal practitioners. And you see this distortion in, in this whole new reality that was created that was, you know, women of 2001, the children of 2001, you know, stand for your nation. And we've brought you freedom here from the Taliban. You know, we're with you. 20 years later, you have an entire generation that grew up under, you know, a a, a post-Talib, you know, U.S.-backed regime, uh, two governments, and they invested their time and their minds into education for nothing. You know, now the United States leaves, and and for people who argue, well, you know, Afghans have to take, you know, the helm and 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 you know, lead their futures. I mean, we see an entire gender being erased from the country. How are women supposed to take the helm when the Taliban is very easily and 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 to the behest of of, of so many countries who have just turned their back over and just have let the Taliban do what they want? How are Afghan women and girls supposed to take ownership of their future? I mean, at the Doha talks, the United Nations said that, that it, it was okay for Afghan women not to be a part of it. They they uh, they agreed with the Taliban that they wouldn't allow women to be a part of the main talks. I mean, the fact that the United Nations agreed with the Taliban and accepted the Taliban's demands that women will not be a part of the Doha talks uh, last month is egregious. I mean, the UN Charter has a, a specific um, uh, byline that says that women must be a part of negotiations of and and you know suddenly now you have the Nanish say okay it's it's fine they don't have to be a part of it so when the world is exacerbating this misogynistic regime you know how are Afghans supposed to take accountability of of their country so I find that everything has become so distorted and that's why um perhaps I don't feel that positive about I mean, diplomatic relations or or speaking dim diplomatically with countries on Afghanistan. And I I work so much more on NGOs and humanitarian organizations, organizations on the ground, because what we can work on is the actual tangible work. But in terms of diplomacy, I can just sense that the world just doesn't want to talk about Afghanistan. And it's not my job. I mean, I'm not a politician and I'm not interested in politics. My job is really to, as a technologist, maneuver the politics to say, I understand your personal grievances, but my job here is to keep very important work going on and how can we facilitate that, regardless of your own personal feelings of what happened in Afghanistan. So, you know, it is awkward. I've been to a couple of panels with U.S. officials. I had one who kind of, I guess, um, didn't attack me on stage, but kind of poked some fun at me. And he said, you know, I was talking about a sub app. I was talking about the importance of technology and maneuvering technology, especially with the Taliban now, and that technology could be a catalyst. And he said, "Oh, you know, I didn't know that so many people use phones in Afghanistan." Oh, Christ! What a weird comment to say, especially from this US official. So degrading. Um, yeah, I didn't know what he meant by that. I mean, I knew he was trying to kind of, I guess, poke fun at me because I was over here talking about technology, and he probably was like, "You know, your country isn't even led by." A sustainable regime and you're over here talking about technology but i think that technology knows no bounds regardless of the regime in power but it's interesting to see how you know even u.s officials kind of look down on i guess afghan youth or innovation and say you know that's not it's not the time and place yet but i think that it is exactly the time and place so. not yes ability for what happened i mean the withdrawal from Afghanistan, the, the negotiations, I mean, you know, the U.S. will say we don't negotiate with terrorists and the Taliban. And well, we negotiated with them yeah. and we left an entire half, half the population we left away from the negotiating table and we continue to leave them away from the negotiating table. Mm -hmm. And I mean, sorry, I interrupted you, by the way. No, of course, of course. You're, you're completely right. Yeah. No. Yeah. And I mean, you know, and because I know we're running low on time, but, you know, my last sure. question is, I mean, there are people may hear this conversation and they may take, I think, two divergent messages from this sort of a 
almost a hopeless situation, but a very hopeful people who are working day and night. I mm -hmm. think in pri in private our taxi, you told me you're working like odd hours. You're literally working nights mm -hmm. to like, get this stuff done. And uh, I'm really curious about your take on this. You know, there's the ban on girls' education in Afghanistan. Are there ways in which the international community can, you know, foster that education, perhaps in unconventional ways? I mean, like, is it is it totally hopeless on that front, or are there ways to, you know, get that through, even in the tiniest of ways of methods? Well, I guess I would say that I mean, I'm I'm not a humanitarian in terms of understanding right. how humanitarian or, or aid works, but if I were to make some sort of, I guess, hypothesis, it would be the Taliban very, very much relies on humanitarian aid. We're looking at, I think, 97% of Afghans right now who have stated that they are in some sort of humanitarian need. Mm -hmm. That is an alarming number. We know that the Taliban requires support from humanitarian organizations. I would say that if there was a way to add a benchmark of receiving that aid. And I know that perhaps some would say as a moralistic stance, there should be no benchmarks on humanitarian aid, but this is a very dire situation. I would I would quite I would wonder whether it would be possible to build a benchmark in the humanitarian aid disbursement to say we will be dispersing support and aid only if we can still provide women and girls with indirect support to continue their education. Whether mm -hmm. that's from home, whether that's you know, um, uh, funding some sort of a nationwide campaign to provide solar panels or something to keep girls um, educated and 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 to to study. It's something like that needs to happen, where there needs to be some sort of correlation between the humanitarian aid that the Taliban requires and the change and the the accountability that can happen in terms of girls' education. I only focus really in terms of. I guess my activism on women and girls education because of the fact that the our male counterparts in Afghanistan don't have those similar prob problems. They're still able to go to school, they're still able to go to work. There's and there's no, I would say other than obviously the economic issues of the Taliban coming into power and the sanctions and the impact it's had on Afghan men. I focus on Afghan women because it's a very systematic erasure of a gender. So that's why I say that. Humanitarian organizations, member states, when they're funding the UN and funding these, these international um, NGOs, they need to somehow add that we will no longer be funding humanitarian aid unless Afghan women and girls are somehow supported and to continue their education. And to understand specifically what we still don't know, the Taliban is, doesn't directly answer the question of why can't women and girls return to school? They keep saying we're going to re we're reviewing the curriculum, but that there needs to be a deadline on that. You know, the international community needs to say, okay, you're reviewing the curriculum that it's too Western. Then then give us a deadline that okay by twenty twenty six we'll finish this review and we'll come back with our findings and we'll tell you why. Um, Afghan women and girls can't go to school because the fact that this is the only statement they've made is we're reviewing, we are monitoring. It's been three years. It's It's been mm -hmm. so long. I mean, we need to know now what the issue is. If it's literally just, we don't want women and girls to go to school because they are women and girls, then the international community needs to say, absolutely not. We will not be funding anything in Afghanistan any further until you stand up and build some sort of mechanism for us to facilitate women and girls to continue their education. Like we need some really tough diplomacy right now. And I, I know that there's other crises that are happening for Ukraine and, and in Gaza and, and what's happening there. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we're looking at 20 years of investment from so many countries across this planet and they need to step up and see that investment through. So I would I would hope that if there are any policymakers or or you know technocrats listening, that they ask the Taliban point blank, 
what is the result of this review of the curriculum for women and girls? What is the deadline? If the deadline is here and we find that your review is just that we don't want women and girls in school because of some distorted Talib Diobandist belief, then okay, this is enough is enough, and we're we're gonna re, we're gonna re, revise our funding methods. That's what I think needs to happen next is some tough diplomacy and to stop funding Afghanistan as it was pre-2021. I know that a lot of funding has decreased exponentially. And that's why we have this humanitarian disaster at, at, on our hand. But the Taliban doesn't feel pressed because we saw their ego in Doha. We saw the way that they were so boldly saying that, yeah, we won't be involved in any discussions if women are there. That means they're still not pressed enough. And the world needs to press the There's Taliban. There's no incentive. There's no yeah. pressure. Exactly. They don't feel any pressure. And, and and we need to see that, that they're allowing Afghans to starve, but they don't feel pressure. So that means that either they're getting funding from some sort of other mechanism, but if they felt pressed, I think that we would be in a different place right now, but there they aren't. So someone needs to look into what is causing that boastful ego from the Taliban. That needs to change. Yeah. And I think what you say so importantly is this, the systemic erasure the systemic erasure of women you know yes. this is not just happening by chance it's intentional yes. procedural yes. planned yes and so on so yes absolutely i mean what it was planned you're right it was first it was oh you know it's a winter break the, it's covid the weather's cold the women and girls should stay home and the year after it was okay um girls uh, high school girls, you know, you're not able to take your exams because some sort of break is, we'll extend the break. And then it was, okay, we're going to take out women from university because we're going to review the curriculum to see that it's not too Western and you know oriented. It was planned from the very beginning. And, and I remember speaking in the media in every stage, oh, we've just learned that women can't go to grade. I mean, I was, it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. And it has been. It's gotten worse every single year to the point where girls who started grade nine who started high school in 2021 should have been graduating next year and they've been home for three years. You know, we saw and we've seen an entire high school generation erased. That is, is, is just disastrous for the future of Afghanistan. Um, and, and I've said this before that the Taliban in terms of education for women believes that w there should be enough women to keep other women alive from dying and enough women to help bring the next generation and, and to birth them. That's the only thing is the Taliban wants to have a few women work in healthcare to keep them alive. And then there are a few other ones to, to bear children. That is the value of, I believe, the Afghan woman for, for the Taliban is that the jobs where they just cannot have a man like healthcare, you'll have some women. And, and even if you have some women, a very small amount of women. And that's the value is that you bear children and you help women bear children and then you help them to, to not die. That's it. That, that's what they see the value of education for Afghan women. It's awful. I mean, like, it's absolutely awful. But I think your story, the story of your team, the story of the many women you've interacted with that you've helped through the app uh, that you've just like, been able to, you know, I think change the lives of in many, I think in many subtle ways, right? Like getting one alert could save one life. And if you save one life, I, I think that's worth it. I think that's absolutely worth it. So Sarah, I mean, you're an inspiration, your team's an inspiration, the app's an inspiration. For our audience, I recommend that you all follow Sarah on Twitter, you follow at Asab. It, 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 she has great commentaries on so many issues, but particularly as an advocate for Afghan women. So, Sarah, you know, thank you so much for joining me here today. This has been like an absolute pleasure and an honor. Thank you so much, Andre. And um, yeah, it was an absolute pleasure to join you. It was a great conversation. A lot of questions I've never been asked before, which was very refreshing. And <laughs> I hope to return again soon, hopefully for, for more positive reasons. We're more positive. We can talk about like human-centered innovation or design. Yeah, at some point. for sure. You know, I mean, this is a pretty yeah, depressing uh, day and depressing context, but you know, a lot of amazing work happening in yes, human-centered tech, and um, you know, looking forward to being back in the future. 
Thank you.